Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent. And as you know, coming up this spring, we have spring statewide elections, uh, even a presidential primary election. And our guest today is a candidate for one of those positions. It is a Supreme Court Justice for Wisconsin, and the candidate is Ed Fallon. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, we've, we're having uh, three candidates, um, hopefully get all three on the show. Mm -hmm. We've uh, started, we've we had one uh, interview, one more to go. We'll probably follow the similar format, have you talk a little bit about your background, uh, education experience, mm -hmm. and then get into other things about why you're running. Sure. So I'll let you start with what's your background? Right. I'm happy to be here on the show, happy to be in Hudson again. Um, well, my background, you know, as I tell folks, I'm a very proud child of a Mexican immigrant and a public school teacher. Uh, my father, when he was in teacher's college uh, as a young man, went to Mexico City on a college trip where he met my mother, and they corresponded by letter, which many of your viewers probably don't remember letters, <laughs> but they did. They corresponded by letters after he returned to the United States, and uh, then he went back to Mexico and they got married. And so I was one of four children they raised in the state of Maryland. Uh, typical single family uh, worker household. Money was not in, in abundance, but I was able to go to college on a scholarship and got my undergrad and law degree at Boston University, uh, one of the best law schools in the country. And then I practiced law uh, for corporate clients at a very high level at a national law firm based out of Washington. And I was representing uh, corporate clients in $350 million civil fraud suits, um, white collar crime defense and major FBI investigations. And after about four years of that, I realized that wasn't how I wanted to spend my life. And okay. so my wife Heidi and I talked and uh, I, we moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin in uh, 1992. And so for 27 years, I've been on the faculty at Marquette Law School and I teach constitutional law, corporate law and criminal law. And over the years, I've, I've trained over 2,300 members of the Wisconsin Bar. Wow. And um, so, any children? Yeah, two children. Uh, daughter, Emma, who is uh, 26, living in New York City. And son, Andrew, who is 22, who's currently doing a year-long fellowship in Germany. He's finished his college and uh, trying to figure out what he wants to do with, with his career. Well, uh, that's where a, a lot of us that have 20-year-old somethings uh, yeah. Are, are at that stage, but that's great. Mm -hmm. So um, you uh, live down in the Milwaukee area then? Yeah, I live in the city of Milwaukee with my wife Heidi. Okay. Um, and uh, I've been very active uh, my whole career in, in Milwaukee and southeastern Wisconsin in the nonprofit sector. So for two decades, I've, I've led nonprofit organizations, uh, mostly related to access to justice, uh, helping to provide low cost lawyers to people who have civil cases, whether it's family law, they need a divorce, or they're sued for unpaid hospital bills, um, or immigrant families who are in deportation and have claims of political asylum, or that if they're returned home, there's an abusive spouse waiting. So I've been very concerned my whole career with trying to provide affordable lawyers to people so they don't have to go to court on their own. And that's something that I've been very passionate about as well in my career. Okay. And any political experience, partisan politics, anything like that? No, I've, I've never been uh, active uh, in a partisan way. Um, I've really focused uh, my attentions and my efforts on serving the community and the needs of the community. So whether it's uh, volunteering uh, and leading organizations like I described that provide low cost lawyers or uh, as president of the Latino Community Center that uh, intervened with at-risk youth try and keep them from getting into gang activity, uh, or just being active in the, the local Hispanic community. You know, as a child of a, of a Mexican immigrant, I've always uh, treasured my Hispanic heritage and have been very active uh, in the community that way. Never thought to run for political office. Um, I really feel that what I can offer is my expertise as a constitutional law expert, my uh, qualifications as a, a lawyer, a litigator in federal court at a high level, and my uh, understanding of the challenges working families have in our legal system, 
and how often we have two kinds of justice. You know, the justice, if you have resources, you can expend them for the best, and the justice you get when you don't have resources and you have to go to court on your own. And so from my perspective, really the best way I can serve, uh, not just as a volunteer, but the broader public, has always been to, to serve on our Supreme Court. The uh, students you teach, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the subject areas, uh, is that all generally first year? Uh, I teach uh, throughout the curriculum at the law school. <laughs> Okay. Um, and very proud to say that many of my former students uh, are now uh, judges, prosecutors, elected officials. Um, I think Governor Evers, the last four appointments he's made to the bench, I think were former students of mine. Um, in our state legislature, I'm very proud to say that uh, Representative, Representative Evan Goyke is a former student of mine. He's endorsed my campaign. Um, and so uh, I have... Um, students who are really community leaders all over the state, and I'm very proud of that fact. Okay. And you mentioned about having the experience in the federal system and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. Um, since coming to Wisconsin, have you had opportunity to be involved in litigation in the Wisconsin the circuit court system or the yes. appellate system? Yes. Um, one thing I've done is, as for eight, over eight years, I was of counsel at a law firm in Milwaukee called Gonzalez, Sahio and Harlan, one of the largest, at that time, one of the largest minority-owned law firms in the country, and uh, represent clients in business litigation, shareholder disputes, uh, mostly family businesses um, where there was a falling out. Um, and so I did that for about eight years. One of the things about being a full-time law professor is that there are limitations on how much time you can spend on outside compensated legal work. Right. Uh, and so uh, I had to stay within those guidelines and it sort of limit my practice. Um, and I've also been expert witness in several high profile cases where one of the parties hired me as an expert to explain complicated areas of business law. Business law then is where you're, you would say you'd be hired as an expert then? Uh, my expert witness work has been in business law, um, okay. not so much call for criminal law expertise as an expert. Right. Yeah. Uh, and my constitutional law uh, experience has been um, really um, uh, at, a, at a different level. Um, but I, I certainly have been advising uh, elected officials. I'm very proud of the fact that, for example, I advised Senator Herb Cole on four United States Supreme Court nominations. Okay. So I helped him prepare for the confirmation hearings of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor, and um, Elena Kagan. And also, um, I was approached by the Obama White House uh, when the Merrick Garland nomination was uh, being obstructed by Mitch McConnell in the Senate. Uh, the Obama White House uh, Office of Communications asked me to be one of three law professors in the country to speak out at a national press conference and explain why the Senate obstruction uh, was unconstitutional. So um, I have provided my advice to, to many senior and national officials as well. Okay. Now, we mentioned, I asked you about whether you've run for your partisan political office before, but you have run for office before. In fact, you've run for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Yeah. And that was in 2013? That's right. I ran for the court in 2013. Um, I had uh, people in the community approach me uh, and ask me to run. Uh, at that time, the incumbent up for re-election was Patience Rogensack. And, um, and so I ran, and uh, I think it was a, a quite successful campaign. Uh, even though I did not succeed, I came in second. Yeah. Uh, I had more newspaper endorsements than the incumbent, and I received over 360,000 votes statewide. Um, so I, thought, I saw that as a, as a successful campaign, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what it takes to run statewide in Wisconsin, uh, and it was a very valuable experience. Because you did finish second, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what are your thoughts in getting in a race again, mm -hmm. and now um, there's three candidates, so there's going to be a primary. How do you see that impacting the race? Yeah. Well, I think, um, first of all, um, I think I've, uh, the benefit of having run before is, is people around the state of Wisconsin know who I am, uh, especially in this part of the state, in Hudson, uh, Eau Claire. Um, I, many people remember my run and they're coming up and they're thanking me for, for running again. Um, so I do have benefits from having run. Um, I think that uh, what I learned uh, from running before was that I have to talk about my qualifications and I have to talk about my principles and my values and that in these judicial races, voters really want to know, you know where you stand and what you believe in. Uh, and I think in 2013, I was talking about a state Supreme Court that was becoming too partisan, uh, too divided, dysfunctional. Have you seen that change at all? 
It's gotten worse. It's okay. gotten worse. We have a, a court where it's almost as if um, when you read their opinions, you have, you know, five justice majority, a two justice minority. It's like they're not even talking to each other. It's not like it's as if it's not even the same case. So I, th I was warning about uh, the court headed in a more partisan direction. I think maybe in 2013, um, some of the voters didn't appreciate that yet. But I think if you ask now around the state in 2019, I think anyone you talk to will say, yes, our state Supreme Court has become bitterly partisan and we need to get back to the independent kind of court we used to have. And so have you heard that as a campaign in yeah. response to your campaign? I mean, the, in the course of going around the state, heard yeah, people Jamie, say this. People don't want to see our judicial elections run the same way as our partisan congressional races. They don't want to see judges running attack ads against each other. They don't want to see judges hurling personal attacks. Um, they want to see a, a race for the state Supreme Court in particular, given the importance it plays in deciding our rights. They want to see races run on qualifications, people pointing to, you know, here's my legal experience, here's my education. Um, that's how they want to choose who our justices are, not based on attack ads. Well, one of the problems that I've seen, and it goes all the way back to the 90s, when I ran for office in the mid-90s, was independent groups mm -hmm. starting to do expenditures, especially yeah. when we were trying to introduce campaign reform yeah. and so forth, and yeah. the ability to get some public money, had to agree to certain limitations and whatnot, but then people started skirting around that, but yeah. you know, with the independent groups, and the problem with the independent groups is that they uh, do their ads and they spend their money without consulting the, the candidate because yeah. otherwise they wouldn't be independent. So did you see that happen in your 2013 race? And uh, do you see it happening? I think in, 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 in 2013, um, there was not a lot of independent money spent. Um, I fully expect this to be very different. But from my perspective, um, you know, and as you indicate, there's no way really to control what these outside groups say. You almost, as a candidate, have no control over your own campaign. But um, from my perspective, they can't define me if I've already defined myself. And I've got a 30-year career. And I mean, the people of Wisconsin know who Ed Fallone is. Um, I've been speaking out. I've been on Wisconsin Public Radio talking about legal issues. Um, I've been interviewed by statewide media on countless topics. And in particular, I've spoken out when I saw, for example, Governor Walker trying to charge fees to anyone who tried to protest at the state capitol. Now, I wrote an opinion piece in the newspaper. I said, you can't put a price tag on the First Amendment. Um, mm -hmm. Many media outlets agreed with me because they quoted me in their editorials opposing that. Um, I spoke out against uh, the legislation that gave special favors for Foxconn in order to attract them. I said we shouldn't have special rules for special people in our justice system. It should be the same rules for everyone. So I think because I'm a known quantity, the people of Wisconsin know who I am and what I stand for. Uh, I'm not worried about having outside money come and try to scare them about me. Okay. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the idea of uh, equal justice and so forth, the recusal, um, uh -huh. you know, that's become an issue where uh, every person who, whether they're appointed to the bench and then uh, retain, win retaining election or they're elected to the bench, mm -hmm. they all come with pre-justice backgrounds. And do you feel that there's been sufficient recusal or do you see that as an area that needs some better enforcement? Well, I, you know, here, here you've hit on it. I mean, this is an issue I talked about in 2013. So in another sense, this is an example of where maybe I was ahead of the curve talking about something before a lot of people in the state recognized how important it was. Uh, right now, what we have is a, is a rule at the state Supreme Court that says uh, judges are not required to recuse themselves or step down from hearing a case just because a party to the case gave them major campaign contributions. Um, and obviously, I think that that's outrageous. And I th said so in 2013, and I've been saying so since. I've been speaking out, calling for reform and change uh, consistently, working with Common Cause Wisconsin, and doing public speaking, even appearing in a video, uh, trying to educate the public about this after my last race. Uh, and, and it's simple fairness. Um, if I'm in a case and the opposing party gave major campaign con contributions to the judge, and then I lose, 
and I walk out of the courtroom, I have no way of knowing whether I lost on the merits or whether I lost because the judge was favoring the other side. And when you say major, what would be your dividing line? Because obviously somebody that gives 10 bucks to a campaign yeah. is not necessarily going to be buying much favor with a contribution like that. But do you, yeah. would you have a dollar limit? Well, that? absolutely. And, and there was a proposal by a group of retired judges who got together and they mapped out a proposal. Here's a model rule. And it had a sliding scale of dollar amounts that would require recusal, starting at the circuit court or trial court, then going to the court of appeals. And the number for the state Supreme Court would be if a party in the case gave you more than $10,000 to your campaign within a couple years of you running, you should step down. Now, as a candidate who ran before and is running now, I can tell you there are very, very few contributors at that $10,000 level. Right. So we're really not talking about requiring recusal very often. We're talking about the very small number of big, big donors and just telling them, you can elect whoever you want to the court. You just can't guarantee they're going to be sitting there deciding cases you're a part of. And I think that's simple fairness. Well, and uh, I think it was, I probably read it in a John Grisham novel, but I think that that was the premise of one of uh, his books was because at the Supreme Court level, mm -hmm. um, you can anticipate if there's a case that you know is going to be controversial, and that could be a corporation, uh, and I don't want to name names, but a corporation yeah. that's challenging, for instance, an environmental regulation, Yes, and uh, they're thinking about putting it into suit. It's going to be two and a half years mm -hmm. before that gets up a good two and a half years before it gets to the Supreme Court. Yes. So you could be funding candidates maybe on both sides or putting your money um, in so that, and, they, and corporations sometimes do that. They, con Absolutely. They, they contribute to both sides. Jamie, I represented these corporations in practice. I know they have political strategies years in advance in order to elect uh, both you know, congressional seats to people who favor them, but also judicial candidates. It's absolutely how they operate. And we've seen examples in other states, uh, such as West Virginia, where a party, a polluter, made major campaign contributions to elect someone who ended up being the crucial vote uh, in their favor in a case. Um, and I don't think in Wisconsin we need to wait for a scandal like that. I think it's just common sense. We should just change the rules. There's no harm. No one has a right to say, I want that judge. You can elect right. anyone you want, but you don't have a right to say, that's the judge I want on my case. Right. And so what do you see in particular about Wisconsin justice system um, in your experience, you know, in academia, you get to um, analyze these things, but what do you see as trends that you think you might be able to have an impact if you're elected as a justice? Well, I think, you know, I bring a, a diverse perspective to the court, and, and I think that that's really important. Uh, we sometimes try to talk about you know, judicial elections as if there's some model judge, some kind of perfect resume that you know, if we had seven people with that exact resume, that would be a great thing. Um, and I'm here to tell you, um, we, we already have you know, three justices who are former prosecutors and then were a trial judge and now they're on the state Supreme Court. Three of our seven justices have that background. We don't need a fourth. You know, what we need is a different range of legal experience. I mean, the law is more than just criminal trials. You have civil litigation, right? You've got business law. You've got family law. Um, and the Supreme Court issues decisions that are so important to all of these areas. You also have constitutional law. They're deciding our constitutional rights. So my campaign is premised on the idea, let's have at least one member of our court who's a constitutional law professor, who's a criminal defense lawyer, not from the prosecutor side. We haven't had one of those since Lewis Butler lost his reelection over 10 years ago. And someone who's actually worked alongside working families and our immigrant communities and who understands the challenges they face in our legal system. There's got to be room for that voice on our court. And, and then I just tell people in the campaign, you know, who was, in, in my view, the best uh, justice in our state Supreme Court in our state's history? Someone who was a law professor, had never been a trial judge and gave us four decades of leadership and courage and defense of our civil rights, which is Justice Shirley Abramson, who just recently retired. And so I feel we need to replace her voice and her perspective. We need a broader uh, set of experiences represented in the court. And I think when that happens, when more judges with different perspectives are on the court, then you have justice, right? And, and in addition to that, 
I'd be the first Latino on our state Supreme Court. And I think it's important that judges reflect our state's population as well. Um, people are, you know, curious, you know, why somebody runs for a statewide office. You've explained that. Um, but, you know, what is part of that process? Obviously, you're here in studio uh, getting around the state. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what that's like. Well, it's, you know, I, I'm a firm believer. Um, I need to go to as many parts of the state as I can. I need to talk to local residents. I need to ask them, what are your local concerns? Uh, and I can tell you, I, I do that, and it's amazing to me how, how common our concerns are around the state when it comes to uh, the legal system and what's happening. People are very concerned about the quality of their drinking water, whether it's in Kewanee County up in the Northeast or if it's in Grant County in the Southwest. Um, people are very concerned about drinking water quality and uh, if local communities even have the power to regulate and control runoff from these corporate farms. Uh, that's a common concern. People are very concerned about uh, public financing of our schools and how are we paying for public education and whether local communities have any ability to decide how to fund their public schools or whether um, their, their say is taken away from them. And, and a lot of these issues, it's our state Supreme Court who ultimately decides is the decision going to be made at the local level? Is the decision going to be made in the state capitol, in the state legislature? Or sometimes our, our state Supreme Court decides the decision isn't even an option. Our, our state constitution has taken this off the table. So it's an important, important body. One of those statewide um, issues and one that kind of intersects with the judiciary because, well, the general election for this Supreme Court justice is going to be the same day as and in the same election as our presidential primary. Yeah. And one of the big issues that saw its way, work its way through the courts and up to the Supreme Court was redistricting. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Wisconsin was one of the you know, leading cases mm -hmm. that, that went. Um, what's, what do you see and what have you seen in that arena that you think uh, we need to avoid repeating? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, uh, Gerrymandered legislative districts are a real concern around the state. People are upset. And right now, this is the time when all candidates have their nomination papers out and they're getting signatures. And so as I go around the state to events, I, I listen to the local candidates. And as they're getting signatures, you know, they're, they're saying these outrageous things like, well, you know, if you're to the east of Broad Street, you're in my district. But if you're across Broad Street, you're not. Or if you're north of the high school, you are. But if you're south, you're not. And you can really see this gerrymandering and its effects right before your eyes as, as these people have to try to explain who's in my district and who isn't. And people don't even know because it's so convoluted. Um, I think it's obvious that after the census, we're going to get new district maps drawn up. Right. Um, and I think it's obvious that after that happens, there's going to be litigation. They're going to be challenged in the Wisconsin courts. And that question of whether those maps violate our First Amendment rights, whether they violate our equal protection rights, is going to go to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. It's clear. Now, I plan on being there in the court. And so I'm not expressing any view one side or the other as to uh, how I would approach that decision. I'm going to listen open uh, to both sides. But I can tell you this, as a constitutional law professor, I have long said our Constitution's job is to defend our ability to govern ourselves, to have us have a voice in the making of the laws that we live under. And so that's my starting premise. And so that's the approach I'll take as I decide that case. And aside, not trying to indicate how you would decide one way or the other, but what is your feeling on the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling on that? Oh. Their solution was, uh, yeah. we're not going to deal with it, and it, if it's partisan, it needs to be decided in another arena. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a very strong um, critic of the U.S. Supreme Court decision where they uh, essentially said federal courts cannot hear challenges to gerrymandered maps. Their rationale was, uh, we don't know the difference between a map that's kind of gerrymandered and a map that's too gerrymandered. And they said, we, if we don't know how to draw the line, then federal courts should just stay out of this, is essentially. But I can tell you, um, there were plenty of tests, objective tests that were presented. They had multiple tests they could have chosen 
that would have distinguished between maps that were slightly partisan versus maps that were just outrageously partisan. They just didn't choose one of those tests. So it wasn't as if they had no way to tell the difference. It's just they decided they didn't want to tell so the difference. So it wouldn't have to be, and I'm, I'm blanking on the justice's name, but uh, nearly 100 years ago when there was uh, a case uh, involving pornography and the justices were struggling with defining it, and they say, I, I can't tell you what it is, but um, I know it when I see it. Type. No, not at all. They're actually um, uh, some very basic statistical models, just using math, that can tell you, for example, looking at the way the map is drawn, that there's a 99% probability that it was drawn based on partisan political lines. Uh, I even had high school students ex explain to me the various uh, formulas. Um, it was actually interesting to me that a group of high school students had taken on as a project to look at these. They could do it, but our U.S. Supreme Court justices They absolutely could. could. They explained it to me. I understood it perfectly, but apparently our U.S. Supreme Court couldn't. Okay. Um, what impact does this have on your work schedule going around the state like this? Are you done with the fall semester? Or? I have finished the fall semester. Thank you for caring. Um, I, I've been teaching full-time, a uh, normal course load at Marquette Law School, and still campaigning across the state, um, which is a challenge. But uh, the semester is now done, so I have my stack of exams and my stack of research papers to grade. Uh, and then in the spring semester, starting in January, I, I plan on teaching part-time. So just I'll just teach my constitutional law class and that'll give me a little more time to get around the state. I am curious uh, because us, well, you're now in the 7th uh, Congressional District, uh, sitting here with this interview in St. Croix County, and we've been sitting for, I think, a couple months now with no representation in Washington because Sean Duffy re, yeah. uh, resigned mm -hmm. uh, and not didn't stay there until someone else could take his place. Yeah. And there was a little bit of political um, posturing with, with the dates for uh, when the oh. elections and the primary and right. so forth. So have you seen, been in the 7th much to, to see what kind of, what voters are saying about that? Because it has a slight impact because at least one of those uh, elections will be coincide with, uh, I guess, your primary. That's right, that's right. Um, well, I know, I know people are very concerned um, about the lack of representation and there was a lot of concern about when the date of the primary would be and when the special election would be, because obviously you don't want to go a long period of time without representation. But I think it was a problem with the state law coinciding with the federal law and so forth. Yeah, and it, it, maybe the problem is, I don't know if it's a problem, but maybe it's just that we have a lot of elections in Wisconsin, and so scheduling in a special election can be a challenge. Um, I, this is um, my first uh, trip through the 7th District um, on this campaign. I spent yesterday in Eau Claire County uh, today in Hudson. Um, I do plan on coming back. Um, this is a part of the state that is very important to me and it's also a part of the state, quite frankly, that um, I, I feel very fondly towards because when I ran in 2013, I, I got a great deal of support uh, up here uh, in, in Hudson and, and in Eau Claire. So it's great to be back. It's been a couple years. I'm enjoying seeing old friends, having people come up and say, I was for you in 2013, I'm for you again. Uh, as a candidate, that's the greatest thing you can hear. Um, that's, that's great. Now, we're talking about the campaign and we haven't mentioned the website. What, what website do you have? Uh, the website for my campaign is falloneforjustice.com. So F-A-L-L-O-N-E, the word for, F-O-R, uh, justice.com. So all one word. Falone. All one word, no dots, easy to find. And the falone, just remember the E because it's silent. There right? you go, remember the E. It's like Stallone. There you go. Any resemblance is coincidental. Okay. And uh, the final thing about that website, I noticed you have a tab on writings. Yeah. Can you tell us briefly what that, why you did that? Yeah. I, I am always a believer in transparency in government and transparency of candidates. I think people have a right to know who they're voting for and what they stand for. And so since I do have a 30-year career of speaking out on issues related to constitutional rights, civil rights, um, all sorts of issues of good government, I figured let's put everything I've written on the campaign webpage and people can read for themselves. So it's very easy. You go to falloneforjustice.com, you click on writings, and you have page after page if you want, if you have the time. You can see my position on the John Doe investigation, on Act 10, on the Trump Muslim ban. It's all right there and people will know exactly who they're voting for February 18th in the primary. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, Ed, for being on the show. Ed Fallone, running for Supreme Court Justice in Wisconsin. And thank you.
for watching another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson. Keep watching.